Morning, or evening, grass brethren and sisters. Let's have Oliver back along with us here or with our Temperance Awakening and look forward to the alcohol lecture uh, that uh, we also have here today, looking at the causes of alcoholism. And as you uh, saw the title there, uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, the evils, you know, the evils of alcohol as outlined also in the Word of God. And so, of course, you know, we're faith-based. I'm a minister. And uh, so we do also talk about, like, the health and, like, the social aspects of alcohol, tobacco, and pornography here. You know, but uh, today, largely in the, uh, in the spiritual, looking at the spiritual aspect of all these things, what the Word of God has to say about this. <clears throat> and so getting right into things here, looking at the causes of alcoholism. And scientists have researched alcohol for many decades, you know, yet they still have mixed opinions on what exactly causes alcoholism. Alcoholism, you know, being the addiction to alcohol or the physical and emotional dependency on alcohol. And there have been many theories proposed over the last uh, two centuries regarding alcoholism. And in the Bible, you know, we find the definitive reason for alcoholism. You know, this reason really is the same position that's taken by the temperance movement. You know, that I believe we actually discussed in the last lecture, maybe the one before, you know, the temperance movement that began uh, like in the 1800s. And alcohol is an evil, you know, dangerous substance. And if one consumes alcohol, they submit themselves to the disease that is alcoholism, because alcoholism is also a disease. You know, like that's, you know, something that's believed by the... Like, by Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, that's kind of one of their philosophies, and, you know, the Word of God agrees with that. You know, we have to, we have, that's why we have to abstain, you know, they're both right. As taught by the Word of God, we're going to look at, you know, we abstain from alcohol, because alcohol is an evil, dangerous substance, is an evil, dangerous substance that causes a very, very bad disease. <clears throat> And so we'll get started here in the book of Proverbs, chapter 20 and verse number 1. Like I actually have written down many, many scripture references here that are going to be in the book that I'm currently writing about our call, but we will not read every single one of them. But uh, we will count them, though, and we'll give you the number, or try to give you the number here of all of them. And starting here in Proverbs, chapter 20 and verse number 1, it says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. See, the book of Proverbs is known as the book of wisdom. And five times, Proverbs warns about the snare of foolishness, you know, the snare and the foolishness of alcohol. Like also we find in Proverbs chapter number uh, 23, the Bible says, starting here, verses uh, 20 and 21, it says, Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe the man with rags. And then we uh, go down there to verse number 29. It says, Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. See there right there, you know, that's the disease of alcohol. Look not thou upon the wine, when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. See, that's what that disease of alcohol causes you to do. Yet thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, thou shalt... Thou hast strick, they have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. And see, just to throw in this comment as well, this fact, you know, the alcohol, alcoholic beverages that we have today have even more alcohol content than what was in Bible times. Like this, you know, wine, you know, that they had, alcoholic wine, you know, that they had in Bible times, it had a very much lower content of alcohol, you know, than the alcoholic beverages that are out there now. <clears throat> and also Proverbs chapter 21 and verse number 17 it says, He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. And the last one that we'll look at in Proverbs, from Proverbs chapter number 31, is in verses 4 to 6. It says, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. And so to add to the Proverbs here, the Bible has, as we said, there are many more warnings 
against alcoholic beverages. And I said, well, I won't look at all of the ones that, uh, that I have here, but uh, we'll look at a few of them, though. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, the Bible says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is access, but to be filled with the Spirit. See, we're supposed to do the opposite, you know, drinking alcoholic beverages, and that's being filled you know, with the Spirit of God. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse number 11. Like it says, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, it says, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for a ward, and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Isaiah chapter 28 and verse number 3. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trodden under feet. Isaiah chapter 28 and verse number 7, the scriptures say, But they also have erred through wine, and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine, they are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision, they stumble in judgment. Now look at Romans chapter 13, verse 13. <clears throat> It says, Let us walk honestly, isn't the day not in riding and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. <clears throat> and now for the uh, the last text that we'll uh, that we'll look at here, we'll look at Habakkuk chapter number two. Actually, since I'm already over here in my Bible, we'll read Hosea four eleven as well. It says, Whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart. And now we'll go over to good old brother Jose's minor prophet colleague, Habakkuk. And look at chapter number look at chapter number two. And verse five. <clears throat> says, Yea also, because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell. And is his death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. Now skip down to verses 15 and 16 of Habakkuk 2. It says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Thou art filled with shame for glory, drink thou also, and let thy foreskins be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. And next we are going to look at some other uh, passages here, but there we're going to look at what they particularly say about alcohol and kind of people that they apply to. But we have more just what I'll call, you know, generic verses here. And we'll go back here and count all of them whenever we finish all of our uh, Bible reading here. Now we're going to go to Galatians chapter number 5 and verse number 21. It says, Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, <coughs> excuse me, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. See, people who give themselves to alcohol will, no have, will have no part in the kingdom of God. Like the Apostle Paul also told that to the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse number 10. Where it says, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So now we'll go over to 1 Timothy, chapter number 3. You know the Bible, probably know where I'm going here. Starting in verse number 1, 1 Timothy 3, 1 says, This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth the good work. The office of a bishop there, just being a preacher. You know, the biblical term for the preacher that they used back then. Some people still use that now, but more, uh, like more Baptists and Protestants, you know, they used the term preacher or pastor. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine. No striker, not gritty, a filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. 
See then verse number 8, Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy, a filthy lucre. See, God deems alcohol, you know, to be such a wicked practice. A man who consumes alcohol is not qualified to be a preacher or a deacon. And then also here we'll look at a few of the uh, a few of the stories very early on in the Bible, starting in the book of Genesis, chapter nine. <clears throat> See very early here in our Bible, in the book of Genesis, we got two very sad stories that show the results of alcoholism. We said they're starting in Genesis nine to verse number twenty. It says and Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japhath took a garment, laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backward, and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Cain, and a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be a servant. God shall enlarge Japhath, and he shall dwell on the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be a servant. <clears throat> and so we see there from that uh, text <clears throat> that Noah's younger son Canaan and all of his offspring, you know, were cursed because of drunkenness. So see, see, it was the Canaanite people that the people of Israel, you know, drove out, you know, to inherit that land. And then Genesis chapter number 19, starting in verse number 30, says, And Lot went up out of Zoar, and dwelt in the mountain, and his two daughters with him. For he feared to dwell in Zoar, and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in, and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. It came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father, let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in, and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also, when the younger arose, and lay with him, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. And the firstborn bare a son, called his name Moab, the same as the father of the Moabites unto this day. And the younger shall also bear a son, called his name Ben-Ami, the same as the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. Lot's two daughters got him drunk to have children with them so that their seed would continue. And see, their sons Moab and Ammon were the founders of those two tribes. You know, they bear the same name, Moab and Ammon. And those two tribes, Moab and Ammon, have all, you know, were always at war with God's people. You know, they eventually ceased to exist as a people, you know, as people groups. <clears throat> now, some people might propose that question, you know, we're going to address it here. Well, didn't Jesus and other believers drink wine in the Bible? <clears throat> and in the Bible, there was, you know, fermented, i.e. alcoholic wine, and unfermented, i.e. non-alcoholic wine, which is essentially grape juice. And the Bible uses those term, the term wine, interchangeably. You know, just that one term, wine, interchangeably for alcoholic wine and non-alcoholic wine. And that's not very uncommon because we still do that today with cider, you know, like apple cider. You know, like there's, you know, like some people today, you know, they just say cider. I had some cider. I drunk some cider. You know, we often don't say alcoholic cider or non-alcoholic cider. You know, we kind of, you know, the same way, you know, we use that term. And it's pretty easy, actually, to discern when the Bible's talking about, al about alcoholic wine and non-alcoholic wine. So when the Bible is speaking of alcoholic wine, it's always in a negative aspect. You know, just like with Proverbs 21, you know, and all the many verses that we just quoted there. And we'll actually go back and we're going to give you those verses now before we continue in the lecture. <clears throat> we had um, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. That was the first verse. And then we had... Um, four more in Proverbs, Proverbs 23, 29 to 35, Proverbs 23, 20 and 21, Proverbs 21, 17, then Proverbs chapter 31, verses 4 to 6. 
And then uh, some of, a few of these we quoted, many of these didn't. Number six, we had Ephesians 5.18. Number seven, Isaiah 5.11. Number eight, Isaiah 5.22 and 23. Number nine, Isaiah chapter 28, verse 3. Number 10, Isaiah 28, 7. Number 11, Romans 13, 13. Number 12, Luke 21, 34. Number 13, Judges 13, 4. Number 14, Habakkuk 2, 5. Number 15, Habakkuk 2, 15 and 16. Number 16, Hosea 4, 11. Number 17, Isaiah 28, 1. Number 18, Luke 1, 15. Number 19, 1 Corinthians 5, 11. Number 20, Ezekiel 44, 21. Number 21, Isaiah 24, 9. Number 22, Joel 1, 5, 23, Ecclesiastes 10, 17, 24, Amos chapter 2, verses 6 to 8, number 25, Deuteronomy 21, 20, 26, Deuteronomy 29, 6, 27, 1 Peter 4, 3, 28, Matthew 24, 44 to 51, number 29, Galatians 5, 21, number 30, 1 Corinthians 6, 10, 31, 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 3, and number 32, 1 Timothy 3, 8. <clears throat> and then we have number 33, Genesis 9, 20 to 27, that story. And then number uh, 34, the last story that we read there from Genesis 19, verses 30 to 38. <clears throat> As we said, there's always like in a negative aspect, like in Proverbs 20, uh, verse 1, the many other verses we quote, and like non-alcoholic wine is used in a joyous way. You know, like as in Israel's offerings and their festivals, like in Leviticus 23, 13, Numbers 15, 5, Deuteronomy 12, 17. Those just a few, a few of the verses there, like you can read more in the Old Testament. Like how, you know, they use non-alcoholic wine in their offerings and for festivals and things. And then also, like we mentioned Jesus there, like in the book of John chapter 2. Whenever Jesus turned water into wine at that wedding, that was grape juice, non-alcoholic wine. And then like another passage of scripture here that confuses many people, because I'm I'm not going to avoid anything here. And that's no and that's a Deuteronomy chapter number 14. Deuteronomy chapter 14, particularly verse number 26. Now we'll read verses, uh start in verse number 22 and read down to verse number 26. And this here is actually talking about tithing. Uh, talking about tithing, and then it gets into the Lord telling the people of Israel that, you know, they can use finances for things that they'll enjoy after, after they tithe. <clears throat> Starting in verse number 22, it says, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thine oil, and of the firstlings of thy herds, and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then shalt thou turn it into money, and bind up the money in, in thine hand, and shalt go into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose." And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. So whatever their hearts desire, you know, they can use their money on for things. It says for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth, and thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice thou in thine household. So, you heard there it said wine, and you know, like, like I said there, we distinguish between the non-alcoholic wine and alcoholic wine, but it also did say strong drink. See, nobody can deny that that verse said the people of Israel may purchase strong drink. So is that saying there that those people could drink, you know, alcoholic beverages? Because even some fundamentalists, you know, have, have, have said that before, like just one or two people that I've, you know, read after and all. They say, well, and they'll say, well, like in the Old Testament, those people could occasionally drink alcoholic beverages. But look at that verse there. Look at what the latter part of that verse says, after strong drink. It says, Or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth, and thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God. <clears throat> See, these Israelites could purchase strong drink, but that was to cook with. See, just like today, you know, in ancient times, people used alcoholic liquids to cook with. You know, just like today, you know, there are people that use alcoholic wine to cook with. And whenever you cook with alcoholic liquids, the alcohol evaporates. See, it evaporates over time, over cooking. 
See, and to add to all that, you know, we just quoted Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 1. You know, that says, wine is a marker, strong drink is raging. See, the Bible would, you know, just be, would be contradicting itself if it approved of these Israelites drinking alcohol. And then also look at something else here that, you know, you have to take notice of. It says, you know, for wine or for strong drink, whatsoever thy soul desireth, and thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice thou in thine household. See, this feast the Israelites were having, that was before the Lord. You know, they were doing that in the temple, you know, in the, you know, in the temple, you know, before the Lord. You know, how much sense would it make to get drunk, you know, on strong alcoholic beverages? You know, before you go into the house of the Lord, I mean, even people that don't think there's anything wrong with drinking, you know, they're not going to, you know, drink alcohol, you know, drink alcohol and then go to church. You know, that just doesn't make any sense at all. And seeing that to that, no strong Christian of great quality has endorsed drinking alcohol. Like a Charles Spurgeon said in 1882, next to the preaching of the gospel, the most necessary thing to, to be done in, in England is to induce our people to become abstainers. Then in 1884, he went on to say, those beer shops are the curse of this country. No good can come of them, and the evil they do, no tongue can tell. The beer shops are a pest. The sooner their licenses are taken away, the better. And like a Charles Finney, a leader of the Second Great Awakening in the United States, was also a leader of the temperance and prohibition movements, you know, during the 1800s. Like Brother Finney used to always say, temperance always accompanies revival. On June 27, 1850, Reverend Finney taught a lecture entitled, Total Abstinence, a Christian Duty. And this lecture, Reverend Finney said, I shall state my proposition, which is simply this. The manufacture, sale, and use of intoxicating drinks as a beverage or as an article of luxury or of diet or to provide them as such for others is neither benevolent nor expedient and is therefore wrong. <clears throat> now, so anybody who joined the Holy Club, which was the prayer, Bible study, and revival group founded by John Wesley, Charles Wesley, and George Whitfield during the First Great Awakening, of the 1700s, if they joined the Holy Club, they had to abstain from alcohol. You know, preaching from Habakkuk 2.16, John Wesley proclaimed, Are you a man? God made you a man, but you make yourself a beast. Wherein does a man differ from a beast? Is it not chiefly in reason and understanding? But you throw away what... You throw away what reason you have. You strip yourself of your understanding. You do all you can to make yourself a mere beast. Not a fool, not a, not a madman only, but a swine, a poor filthy swine. <clears throat> he said, go and wallow with them in the mire, go drink on till thy nakedness be uncovered and shameful spewing beyond thy glory. Of course, the revivalist Billy Sunday was known for his staunch opposition to alcohol. One of the most famous sermons he ever preached was simply titled, Booze. Brother Sunday's advocacy for prohibition is largely what led to the Prohibition Amendment of 1919. And now kind of switching gears a little bit, we'll also look at uh, some other things about alcoholism here. You know, like the causes of alcoholism, kind of the causes of alcoholism, what can lead a person into alcoholism. And there do seem to be social and cultural causes of alcohol abuse. Many people do turn to alcohol as a result of low self-esteem or conflicting issues, you know, that they're struggling with. You know, that's pretty common knowledge. You know, you get upset about something, you go drink yourself, you know, you go drink your sorrows away, as they see, as they say. And some people who live in areas where heavy drinking is promoted, you know, are more prone to drink, like these being whole countries, you know, i.e. like entire countries that can be really big on drinking, like Germany and Ireland. And then some more individual communities, you know, like, the Native American reservations in North America, they have a they have a higher, you know, drinking rate than like non, you know, Native American reservations. <clears throat> then of course certain professions, you know, can also influence its employees to drink, of course. You know, like people in the military, you know, they're known for their drinking habits. And then also like police officers, firemen and emergency medical technicians, they have a reputation of hitting the bars after work. 
And like social circles, you know, often persuade its socialites to drink. Of course, teenagers in the public school, you know, that's probably, you know, the most notorious of this stereotype. And like men who are members of certain lodges and organizations, you know, can be tempted to drink, you know, with their fellow members. And that's why as believers we have to be very careful, you know, with whom we surround ourselves with. Like 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, abstain from all appearance of evil. You know, simply don't go to a place, don't be a part of something that's going to influence you in that way. Like 2 Corinthians 6.17 says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Like our Revelation 18.4, <clears throat> it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. You see, and unfortunately, of course, many people learn the behavior to drink alcohol, like a children of parents who drink, are four times are more likely to drink than other children who had parents that didn't drink. And of course, that leads to the next issue, which is scientists and medical experts have tried to discover a possible genetic link that causes alcoholism to run in family. Scientists have done research studying like twins and children adopted into and out of alcoholic families for quite the while. Like a famous 1960 study of the drinking patterns of more than 900 twins in Finland sparked a generation of similar research projects in the United States. And like identical twins share the, share the same genes. Like fraternal or dizygotic twins share no more genes than other brothers and sisters do. And studies have consistently found that identical twins are significantly more likely to to both be alcoholic, you know, when one is alcoholic, then are non-identical twins when one is alcoholic. So these studies do seem to support a strong genetic link to alcoholism. The nature part of the question, though they generally don't look at environmental factors that might work as well. Environmental factors, you know, that means nurture, which, you know, we just mentioned there, which we're going to look at a little bit more in a moment. Adoption studies have looked at both sides of the question. Large-scale adoption studies done in the late 1970s and 1980s compared adopted male children who had at least one alcoholic biological parent to adopted males who had no biological family history of alcohol abuse. The adopted children whose biological parents were alcoholic were four times more likely to become alcoholics themselves even when they were raised in a non-alcoholic adoptive family. So study there certainly does suggest that it is genetic. And furthermore, the studies showed that adopted children from non-alcoholic biological families had significantly lower rates of alcoholism, even when they grew up with alcoholic foster or adoptive parents. <clears throat> so, as we said there, you know, taken together, the studies certainly do suggest that genetic makeup is a much stronger influence than environment. And so now looking at genetics and biochemistry. In the 1990s, the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism and the Collaborative Study on the Genetics of Alcoholism launched a long-term study to identify the actual genes that may cause alcoholism. Researchers are analyzing the genetic makeup of a thousand individuals from families with a history of alcoholism. To date, scientists have identified a possible uh, have identified a possible strong genetic link to increased alcohol dependence on chromosomes one and seven, and a more modest link for dependence on chromosome two. Researchers have also identified genetic variations that may work to prevent alcoholism, so that's a great thing. These variations are in the genes that produce enzymes that speed up the body's metabolism or breaking down process of alcohol. When the body breaks down alcohol quickly, a large amount of the toxic chemical acetaldehyde is released, making the drinker feel sick and flushed. So in general, people who who uh, suffer this reaction avoid alcohol or they drink very little. For example, there's a relatively low rate of alcoholism among East Asians, many of whom have the genes that cause them to experience the flushing reaction when they drink even a small amount of alcohol, as was reported by the NIAA in 1998. <coughs> the unpleasant sensations more than balance out the high they might get from alcohol. And the NIAA and, and uh, COGA researchers found that individuals from alcoholic families who did not become alcohol abusers themselves had those protective genes. These people appear to have a built-in genetic protection against abusing alcohol. Acetaldehyde also figures prominently in some studies linking brain chemistry and alcoholism. For instance, <coughs> excuse me, 
So for, uh, for instance, acetaldehyde combines with the chemicals in the brain to produce compounds called TIQs. TIQs chemically resemble morphine, a powerfully addictive opiate. This process may account for the craving for alcohol that many alcohol abusers do experience, and so thus a single byproduct of alcohol can have opposite effects on different people. For those who break down alcohol quickly, high levels of acetaldehyde produce unpleasant symptoms that turn them off of alcohol. For those who bring down alcohol gradually, the same chemical help creates powerful cravings for the beverage. Alcohol also appears to increase or decrease levels of certain brain chemicals, notably serotonin, a complex chemical in the brain that transmits nerve signals. An imbalance in serotonin levels has been linked to depression. When levels are restored, a feeling of well-being seems to result to the extent that alcohol may increase serotonin levels. Some drinkers may be unwittingly medicating themselves when they drink. Some alcoholics show imbalances in brain chemistry, according to George F. Koob, head of the NIAA research program on the microbiology of alcoholism. Koop said in April 2001 that some alcoholics may have a hyperactive stress system and may be using alcohol just to feel normal. However, it's not clear whether the imbalance causes alcoholism or vice versa. And so in conclusion there, most experts do agree that genetics play a major role in the development of alcoholism. They generally estimate that between 40 and 60% of the risk for alcoholism is genetic, but genetics isn't the only case. Ongoing research could also clarify the relative role of the other factors, you know, including social and psychological problems, and the influence of subcultures and peer groups. And so thanks for being with us uh, here today uh, for this lecture, and uh, next, uh, next lecture we'll be looking at binge drinking among teenagers. So looking at binge drinking, particularly among teenagers. So come on back and be with us. I just said thank you so much for being with us uh, here today, and we'll see you next time. Until then, break in the shadows flee away. I am Dr. Cooper, and I love you, and I appreciate you.